Six thirty, and we will. It's this, it's this thing. Call the <laughs> Kern Council of Governments Transportation Planning and Policy Committee Traumatic. to order. So this new gavel is not mine. It is actually Bill Thomas's, and it was a gift to him from the city of Bakersfield. And this is a core out of the freeway, and uh, some rebar, which I guess came from the freeway also. So it says the T and Trip Centennial Corridor Gavel. So if he leaves, I don't. Uh, it's pretty sturdy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the committee on any matter not on this agenda. Mr. Chairman, I need to do roll call. Dang. <laughs> <laughs> roll call, please. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Blades. Present. Couch. Here. Flores. Here. Cryer. Here. Morris. Here. Uh, Mario. Navarro. Here. Peacock. Here. Perez. Here. Prout. Here. Reina. Here. Bob Smith. I'm here. Bill Smith. Here. Vasquez. Warney. Here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Public comments. I'll start over. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the committee on any matter not on this agenda but under the jurisdiction of the committee. Committee members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the committee at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Do we have any public comments? Mr. Tony. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tony Renteria. I'm the program manager for the Current Active Transportation Alliance. <clears throat> uh, I went ahead and uh, well, I went ahead and made flyers, but Rochelle is just on top of things, so you guys got the flyers already. Um, so, uh, anyways, um, also I have a, a couple updates for y'all. Uh, we have held three smart cycling classes in Bakersfield, and uh, the turnout's been great. Uh, we will schedule one here at the end of the month, and I'll let you know as soon as possible when we get a, a date. Um, also, our Mock City event uh, at the Lamont Boys and Girls Club was a big success. Uh, we had about 20 to 25 kids in attendance. We also had a videographer at the event, and uh, we will be playing that video for you all for the next meeting. Uh, we are currently coordinating more of these Mock City events in your communities, and uh, we will update you again uh, when we have solid dates. Uh, last but not least, we'll be in Taft uh, this Saturday, helping the local Kiwanis Club repair and give out bicycles for kids, uh, and we're super excited about it. Um, so other than that, um, you guys got some paperwork in front of you. Please, I, and I, I urge you guys again, please come out to these uh, community events. Uh, again, all these communities that we're in uh, mean a lot to us. So thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Hearing none, I'll move on to presentation for financial and compliance audit report. Uh, good evening, all. 
Yeah, just for the record, my name is Neeraj Datta. I'm a CPA and audit partner with Brown Armstrong. And with me is Sarah Beth Pryor, and she's the audit manager, and we are here to present the audit results for Cotton Cog uh, as of June 30th, 2023. So you have, we have made a little slides here, so I'll try to run them with this. Oh, Becky, you probably have to run it, yeah. Just, yeah, move it to slide three, if possible. Yes, yeah, so here, like on slide three, we have put a small agenda here. We'll go through the audit timelines, which we follow uh, during the current year to perform this audit, and uh, Sarah Beth will go through in detail, like the critical dates list, uh, which we have, uh, which we agreed upon at the beginning, and how did we finish our audit. So she will go over it, and then after that, I can discuss the results of the audit. I will briefly go over the financial statement review process, which we follow in our, in our office, and uh, thereafter I can take any comments uh, or any questions you guys have. Okay. Okay. As Niraj said, I'm Sarah Beth Pryor. I'm the audit manager for um, this engagement for Kern Council of Governments. Um, so we started our audit, we started planning back in September. We sent out the info request list then, and during that time we did agree upon some dates um, to do the audit. Um, and usually the audit will start with interim field work, final field work, and then just kind of, you know, wrapping anything up, um, drafting the ACFR, getting it approved, and re various reviews. Um, during interim, we did, uh, we tend to do walkthroughs, test of controls, we'll update minutes, we'll have a Oh, hold on a second. Is somebody online that's not muted or something? If you're called in, please mute your microphone. Thank you. I'm, we're sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry again, we're getting a request. <laughs> we're, we're yeah, I'm sorry, we lost your microphone. <laughs> we'll take a brief time out. <laughs> <laughs> we could talk about what a great job they did of the physical lore. Yes, let's talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Is that posted up? I haven't tried to see it. Is it? Uh, uh, not yet. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> now we're good. We apologize double. Oh, no worries. Thank you. Um, yeah, so after we finish field work, we'll draft the ACFR prepare or using information provided by the finance department here and um, we'll issue our opinion and then the reports get presented here at the board meeting and then I'll give it back to Niraj to share the results of the audit. Thank you very much. Sarah. Okay. So as you all know, like as always, like your management prepares these uh, financial statements and uh, we, uh, they hired us to perform an audit on that and give our opinions. So as an External auditor, we render our opinion on these financial statements, and we ensure like uh, they are in accordance with accounting principles, which are generally accepted in the U.S., and they are free of any material misstatements. Now, CONCOG is a governmental entity, so aside then our general audit, proce general audit procedures, we have to ensure like they also meet the governmental audit auditing standards. 
So, uh, so you will see like in your package, we have three reports in your financial statement. The first one is the, our opinion, that is uh, as per the gap, and then there are two additional reports which we have issued. They are required by the governmental auditing standards, commonly known as yellow book standards. So the first report, which is the opinion, which is on page one of your financial statement package, it's an unmodified opinion. So this is the highest form of opinion which an external auditor can provide. So it's a clean, so no issues were found in that uh, opinion. So the second report, which is uh, on page 65 to 66 of your financial statement, it's the compliance report. So it is required by the yellow book. And in this report, while performing our audit, like if we come to know like there are any weaknesses in your internal controls, or any significant deficiency which come to our knowledge or any material weakness, we report it here. Uh, again, like the big marks to your management, we did not find any such issues. So again, it's a clean report. Uh, this report also includes your uh, compliance requirements. So like since we also do uh, the compliance uh, regulations which are specified in CDA Act. So here in this report, you will see we have reported the Kitimishi and the SGR funding status for some cost too. So they are also on that report, page 65 of your financial statements. In the third report, this year, uh, I think I should move that next page here. So if you look at here, like uh, your federal expenditure was about to the tune of 3.2 million this year. So that necessitated a single audit. So we come we performed a separate audit, a single audit pursuant to the uniform guidance. So, and we have issued a separate report for that. You had one major program, and uh, that results of that is on the next slide. There you go. Can you see that? So, so there was one major program, uh, it was a highway planning that uh, we performed the audit for, and uh, highway planning and construction. Again, like uh, on both the sides, the financial statements and the federal awards, like we did not find any issues. It's an unmodified opinion. Again, a clean report here. We did not identify any weaknesses, not, neither any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. They are reported here on this uh, report. So you still qualify as a low risk auditor. So. So next year also, like, uh, you will not be assessed as a high risk quantity as such. So these are the three reports which we have issued for your financial statement purposes. Aside that, there's another report, like, uh, which is a separate standalone report, which is a required communication to the board of directors. Uh, that is pursuant to our professional standards, statements of writing standards 114, so commonly known as SAS 114 letter. So in that report, we, list down our responsibilities in relation to the financial statement so that they are listed there. So any new gas fees which have been implemented in the current year, if they have any significant uh, impact on your financial statements, we report that. So th in this year there were four new uh, gas fees which were implemented, but none of them had any significant impact on the current cost financial statements. Here uh, we also list down the significant estimates which were made like in the financial statements. Two areas uh, were identified where the significant estimates were made, depreciation being the first one. Useful life of the capital assets uh, determines what, how much will be the depreciation, so there's an estimate involved there. The policy which we followed here was like the last year, so no changes were done there too. And second major area where estimates were made were like in your pension liability obligation and the OPEP. You are the member of the CalPER, so that information we procured from uh, CalPERS, and we have listed down uh, all those assumptions which your actuary has uh, utilized to come to your pension obligations, and they are also listed down in note number nine and 10 of the financial statements. There are big notes there, about eight, <laughs> runs about eight pages. We had gone through all those assumptions. We find those assumptions are quite reasonable, so uh, we agree with, agree with that, that those numbers. We do not definitely have no disagreements with the management on any of those estimates or assumptions, and we are also required to report to you if we had any difficulties while performing this audit. We had none. Your staff is awesome, uh, and the leadership of Aaron, Becky, and uh, Sarah, like uh, we never had any issues, so they made our life very easier, so audit went very smoothly. Uh, no findings or issues. Uh, we are also required to report to you if we have any uncorrected misstatements or corrected misstatements which we identified. So there are no uncorrected misstatements while performing our audit. We did propose several adjusting journal entries uh, which management agreed with us and then those has been posted. 
The effects of those has been taken into account in these financial statements. The list of that general entries is also included in your letter, with the SAS 114 letter. So with that, that was like all of our reporting here. Uh, I can move to the next slide, just giving a brief overview. Like a lot of work is done on these financial statements, both from your side and our side. From our side, the first review is performed by, by our administrative uh, clerical department, and then several reviews of the financial statements are performed by, by our engagement team, starting with the manager and comes to me. And then finally, like that, we also have a process of quality control review in our office. Uh, so once we are like done with all our reviews and our audit is complete, like uh, the final audit reports, the draft reports, along with the whole binder, we pass it to another partner or a manager in our office who is not involved in our engagement team. So that's uh, another good, robust process, and they could review the whole binder and ask us any questions. If they have any issues, like we need to address them before they sign off, and it's only after that sign off we can issue that report. It's called engagement quality control review, and the person who does that, we call it core reviewer. So that's the final process which we do. Aside that, we also go over the triennial peer review process. Like every three years, an external auditor comes, and they ensure like all our test engagements uh, which we have issued, have followed, we have followed all the professional standards to uh, complete our audits on that. So that's a really good, uh, robust process so that uh, all the deliverables which we give it to you, which comes to your table, they are of a good quality. And finally, I think the last item there was the Federal Audit Clearinghouse Single Audit Submission. Your deadline was to submit on March 31st. We have already done it the day before. Uh, Sarah must have certified it by now, so it's all done in time. So, so with that, like, uh, I'll again like to thank all your staff and uh, Bridget, if any questions or comments the board may have. Thank you. Uh, I would just say we, we, we do not take this lightly and, and take it for granted. Staff does a good job and we appreciate it. Things do go sideways with governmental agencies sometimes and, and it's not a good thing and so we really do appreciate it. Any other comments from members? Thank you very much. Much Thank appreciated. You. Thank you. Consent agenda opportunity for public comment. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by KernCog staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the council or public wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in the listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council concerning the item before action is taken. Any public have comments on the consent agenda? Any council member wish to remove an item for separate consideration? Motion to approve. Second. Roll call vote, please. Blades? Aye. Couch? Yes. Flores? Yes. Cryer? Yes. Morris? Yes. Navarro? Yes. Perez? Yes. Prout? Yes. Reyna? Yes. Bob Smith? Yes. Phil Smith? Yes. And Warney? Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Item five, public workshop, public comment, 2024 to 2050 growth forecast draft report. Mr. Davison. Good, good evening. Former great employee of the city of Bakersfield, now great employee of Kern College. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Smith. Um, so I'm the uh, project planner for the uh, 2024 through 2050 growth forecast. And uh, this evening, I have the pleasure of introducing um, Steve Gunnels from Placeworks, who the uh, COG engaged for this project. And uh, Placeworks previously did the, did the 2015 growth forecast, and we feel pretty good about it. Mr. Gunnels. <coughs> So a presentation on the audit, and now a presentation on demographics. Does anybody need coffee? <laughs> Keep moving. 
Well, let's just jump right in then. Uh, so what is it we are talking about here in this report? Can you go to the next slide? There's three things, really, broadly speaking. One is we want to get at what are the, what's the number of people that will be living in Kern County. So as we look at that, there's two ways you change the number of people in the county. One is natural increase. That happens regardless of what the government says. There are births and there are deaths, and we look at the rates of those by age group and carry them all forward. Um, one of the unique things that we're looking at now that's become apparent is in 2007, nationally, we hit this peak in not only the birth rate but the fertility rate. So this chart goes back to the early 1900s where the green line is, a green bar. That was the baby boom. World War II was over and people started having lots of babies. And then it came down and we spent decades kind of just up and down a little bit but staying steady. And then things changed in 2007. And for quite a while it wasn't clear you know, there was thinking, oh, maybe this is just um, <clears throat> the recession and the aftermath, but no, this is really what is happening. It's continued to decline. The fertility rate is the lowest it's ever been. And this is not just the United States. Mexico's fertility rate is way down. Uh, a lot, uh, South Korea, China, a lot of countries in the world are going through this uh, drop in the fertility rate. And it, it's happened in California, too. So these are national numbers? Uh, these are national numbers. We also, I think in the report, we put some commentary on what's happened in California, too, because it's, it's, it's happened here. Um, but as we look forward, that change in fertility rate is really impacting uh, the amount of growth we see going forward, especially when we compare it to what was looked at four years ago and four years prior to that, is that downward slope became evident that it, it was a continuing trend, not just a one-time thing because of the 08 recession. So the next slide. So we don't have that data just for Kern County, the fertility rate? We do. The fertility rate, <laughs> that's like a nationalized number, it's easier to pull. What we have for Kern County, for all the counties in California, is the fertility rate by five-year age group. So it starts with 15 to 19-year-olds and goes through 45 to 50-year-old women. So it's a separate rate for each five-year group. Uh, but we do have that. It's going down, and that is what the projections uh, from DOF and looking in the past is carried forward. And this is something most of the demographers you see in the state and the work they're doing looking statewide, uh, it's, it's similar to what's happening nationally with that decline in the fertility rate. <clears throat> so the other way the number of people will change is migration. Uh, people moving into Kern County and moving out of Kern County. <clears throat> and <clears throat> You know, we discuss this a little bit in the report. Uh, you know, the net migration for a five-year period uh, is was four to five thousand. Now, this is total population, so it takes into account the prison population. We've separated that out in our research, so we're looking just at the household population migration rate. Um, but with the net migration of forty-two hundred over a five-year period, you had. 12,000 new residents who moved here from LA County. And so when we look at the migration rate, that's declined. We think that that's probably in part what's happened with COVID and what will happen with Fraser Park and the Tejon Ranch building uh, homes there at the base of the grapevine has the capacity to attract migrants in a slightly different way than Kern County's attracted them in the past. 
because they, you know, for those who are moving but keeping a job in LA County, they'll be that much closer in a commute. So we've, we've not taken the full drop in the migration rate that we see through 2022. We've backed it up and using just the pre-COVID migration rate. The, the two numbers, the 11,000 and the 12,000, can you go back to the graph? Yeah, so the, so the, the one 11, on the left is, is, is the... Uh, all the counties accepting L.A. County? Yeah, so the middle one is your net migration with the rest of California, everything that's not Kern County. Including L.A. County? Including L.A. County. So you had... How can that be less than just LA Well, because you had, you had more people leave Kern County going elsewhere in California than moved from everywhere else in California here. You had a net out migration if you don't count LA County. Gotcha. So you, you know, when you look at the numbers, you are getting you know, 100, 200 from this county and that county and the other county. And some of them, you're losing 100 here and 200 there. Uh, but LA County is the big driver of migration. And that, and, yeah. that's eight years, both those numbers? It's, there were two five-year periods in there that overlapped. And I realized after I was already on the way here, that's, that's the average. That's like a five-year average, not that full period. So that's, that's not an annual. Is that an annual number, though? or what? No, that's, that's a five-year number? Yeah, over five years. Okay. And again, this is, this is picking that average up uh, through 2020. So it's picking up some of the disruptions with COVID. So we're not, we didn't actually use this number to come up with our forecast going forward. But I think this is a helpful number just for understanding where the in migration to Kern County really is coming from. There's a little bit everywhere, but it's really driven by LA County. And what happens in the future will depend on uh, foreign in migration to California, how much that pushes up the state's population, and uh, you know how much of that's going to LA County and you know helping to push people out of LA County wanting to come here. The net number. The, the one negative number is people moving out of California. Right. Yeah, the number on the left is the net migration between Kern County and everywhere outside of California. Yeah, but when you look at what's happening within California, you're getting a lot more people moving in from California than are leaving here to go somewhere else in the US. Okay. So we're talking about the number of people who are coming and going, and we're looking at, uh, you know, by five-year age group, how that changes every five years through 2050. Uh, the other thing we're looking at is uh, the demographics, uh, how those are changing, different characteristics of the people who live here. And again, that, that changes with all of you who've been here and are gonna to continue to be here because we're all growing older, whether we like it or not, that's happened. But it's also a function of who's moving in and who's moving out. So when we look at those migration trends, part of, part of what's in that migration is households moving here with children. And so as that slows, that also slows the number of children that you will have going forward. And so this is kind of that age distribution. The blue bars are where you are today. And the black outline of bars is where we see the population uh, in 2050. And so those are in five-year age groups, the youngest at the bottom going up, uh, with males on the left and females on the right. So what the forecast looked like is having fewer children in 2050 than you have now, about the same number of young adults and middle-aged adults, 
and more of the older adults. So that's an aging of the population. We share that also with California and the US. It's that declining fertility rate is kind of affecting everywhere in the country. And so as we, uh, you know, all of us here or th throughout the US, as we look 10, 20 years down the road, we're gonna have more older people and fewer younger people. Now that, the problem that creates is if people are moving here with kids, they aren't necessarily moving where the families that used to have kids that have grown up are. So you may see some places that need new school after new school after new school and other places within the county where it's declining enrollment. Declining enrollment. Your net number countywide is not really going to grow in terms of school-aged children, but where they live might change. Carl's so gonna beat me up because I, I told him I'd get this done in 10 minutes. So yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm slowing him down a little bit, but, but I mean, California has a higher immigrant population than the United States. Yes. And typically immigrant populations have more kids for the first generation or so. Yes or no? Yes, but. There are two caveats that go with that, uh, and, and, and especially with those who migrate, but we are seeing in some of the countries that fuel some of the foreign migration into California where the fertility rate has dropped. So we're not expecting, say, uh, immigrants from Mexico or China to necessarily be coming with as large a families as they came with 20 years ago. And then what's happened statewide is there's been a decrease in foreign migration uh, from 2010 to today. It's, it's really dropped off and that's why California's population stopped growing. It's starting to tick back up, but it's not back to where it used to be. So we're not sure how much of that foreign migration will return to California. Thank you. Counts everybody, yes. Yeah. I guess maybe the question is, is if they don't live here permanently, if they come up to work a few months and then back to Mexico or back to wherever. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, one of the main sources of data is the American Community Survey, and they're doing that survey every month. So if they are doing a survey and they contact someone who is a migrant laborer, uh, farm laborer, and they're in Kern County when they're contacted, they get counted. And if the next month they're in a different county or a different state, they still show up as being in Kern County, you know, that's kind of averaged in for the year's population as they average all 12 months. So it's not perfect with how it collects that data. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> so some of the other things that are changing with this aging of the population and declining fertility rate is kind of the um, types of households we have. And you know, this looked really big on my computer. I thought it was too big, and I can tell you probably can't see much of it from there, but uh, it's in the report, and I think you'll maybe get a copy of the PowerPoint. It'll be available, I know. Um, but. On this chart, what we see is that blue is the percentage of households in the U.S., the orange is the percentage of households in California, and green is the percentage in Kern County. And so the left set is married couples, married couple families that have children under the age of 18 at home. And you can see nationally that's just over 15%. That's not the way it was back in 1970. That's been declining. Uh, but you still have a higher percentage of that here in Kern County. Um, then there's the married couple families without children at home. Uh, the third one is single parent households with or without children under the age of 18. That fourth column is living alone. And that's actually the largest percentage of households nationwide is individuals living alone. We have less of that in California. 
one might surmise it's because it's hard, it's expensive to live alone in California. Um, but we have less of it in Kern County too. But this is the change and as Kern County ages and with a lower fertility rate, you'll probably expect to see your the structure, the types of households living here in 2050 moving more towards what the st uh, statewide situation is today and the state moving closer to what the national situation with households is. So even with fewer people, you need more housing. Yes. Okay, so the next slide. And then there's the average household size. So the blue line is what's happened nationally since 1970 when the baby boomers were moving out of their parents' house, unlike the kids today who seem hesitant to move out sometimes. But that's been declining and declining and declining. California was going up, and that was, as, as, as you were saying earlier, uh, part of that was driven by the migration and larger families migrating into California. But that peaked in 2017 and has started to decline. So most of the demographers who are looking at the state of California think that's going to continue to decline uh, because of that declining fertility rate and the aging of the population. That will just have fewer, on average, fewer people uh, per household. And then the last thing we're looking at is, um, oops, can we go back one? <laughs> That's okay. Uh, you, you should, you're right to try and speed me along here. Uh, <laughs> the last thing we're looking at really is the number of jobs. And uh, we did, you know, that we look at that in concert with what we're uh, forecasting in terms of households and the ho uh, household population. Uh, you know, what kind of balance uh, we're getting there. Um, and it's, it's important because when you have a growing economy, it helps keep residents you have here. Uh, it gives them less of a reason to move away. Every, you know, people have reasons to move sometimes, but they aren't necessarily moving because they can't find a job locally. And it attracts new bi migrants to the area. But that's partially the story because with so much of the migration into Kern County coming from LA County, a lot of it depends on what's going on in the economy in LA County because some of those people are keeping those jobs when they first move here. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, the, the employment numbers are tricky because COVID changed a lot and we're not sure how sticky those changes were go are going to be, especially the work from home. But I can say, listening to Bloomberg podcast for two years now, all the big corporations have said next month we're making everybody come back to work, and they haven't really succeeded yet uh, because there are fewer people, there's less workers. And if we're not getting the foreign migration, we're not bringing new workers in as fast. So that's really an unknown. Everybody has their opinion of what's going to happen with that, but um, right now they're all opinions. Okay. <clears throat> the Mm -hmm. The demographic, the, the sh people moving immigration from L.A. County to here, how much of that's driven by retirement versus people moving here for jobs? or Do you have those numbers or age groups, I guess? Is that we did look at the age groups. And like I said, a big chunk of it was households moving here with children, the, the net increase. From LA. Was that so? I'm, you know, I'm sure there are some retirees, but I would say from the numbers we looked at, and we didn't look specifically, uh, you know, was somebody retired? But that is less of that migration than it is households kind of middle age with children to them. So how does this all shake out with what the forecast has for the future? <clears throat> and this is only valid today because it all changed tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> This blue line is, is the household population uh, going back to 1990. And then the dotted line is how we forecast that going forward. 
So still substantial household population growth, but the rate of growth is slowing. So if we look at the last 26 years, uh, it was about 10,000 people per year, and now we're looking at about 4,000 people per year on average each year, and a growth rate slowing from 1.5% per year to 0.5% per year. And California as a whole is, is now negative? Is that correct? No, California has picked back up, but it was negative at the census, and I maybe the year after, I, I forget off the top of my head, but it has picked back up, and like I said, the foreign migration is, is picking up. I think last I read, the last year was 250,000 new uh, foreign immigrants to the state. <clears throat> so here, um, the red line at the top is what we, I, forecast back in 2015 when everything was ripping and roaring. We were finally back to work after the 08 recession, and we didn't realize people were actually stopping having babies. We thought that was just a temporary blip. Um, the green line is what is in your current forecast, which fed into your 2022 RTP. And then the blue line at the bottom is the current forecast with that dotted orange line just below it, what DOF's projections for Kern County are. And so we are up above, um, you know, over that 50 year. What's that? Yeah, it's, it's, well, we, we didn't just uh, accept that. We talked it through a lot and looked at a lot of different configurations of it. And um, really, that fertility rate, slowing the number of children born here, really cuts back on the household population. Yeah, it's audience. It's it's just people in the audience answering questions. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Okay, so the next slide. Oh, if we could go back to that one before I get to household size. Um, <clears throat> uh, before we leave the household population, the other thing you're probably aware of is what's been happening with the Department of Corrections closing the community correctional facilities, uh, finishing up closing uh, the, the one prison, reducing population in another one. And there's been a big drop off in the institutionalized group quarters population, which isn't part of household population, which is why we stuck with that. And I think it was last year, last two years, DOF has shown uh, Kern County being the only county in the San Joaquin Valley that didn't grow. But that's because it's taking that prison population in with your total population. You have not had a year since DOF started putting it together in 1990 where the household population in Kern County didn't grow. It's grown every year. But the headline number everybody sees is what's wrong with Kern County? Uh, you know, but, you know, it's not a story that gets talked about a lot of why that is. Um, so one of the things we do is we look at that population projection going forward by the age groups and what percentage in each age group is ahead of household. And that determines how many households we'll have. So the big change in... Um, the age demographic is going to be l fewer of those younger people, but you're still picking up that middle part of the age spectrum. So we don't really see a change in the number of households being forecast from what you had in the previous forecast, the 2020 forecast. Fewer people, 
but still about the same number of households in 2050. So the next slide. So you could almost see the uh, blue line, which is what we're projecting now with the average household size declining. Uh, you know, we pointed out in the report, even where we end up in 2050 is still um, higher, about the same of where the state of California is today. So it's not a, a revolutionary uh, decline in the average household size. It's bringing it back down to kind of where California is today, but we expect California's average household size to also continue to decline. So you'll still be above the state average there. And then the two other lines were the two previous forecasts. And then next slide. So how that shakes out is if you look at the top line there, that's the annual rate of change in the household population. And we're coming in at about half of the annual rate of change in the 2020 forecast. But the number of households, is, the annual rate of change is much closer. And so the result is with more households and fewer household population, that household size goes down. So we're forecasting that to go down to 2.82 persons per household in 2050. Okay. Don't worry, we're getting there. So number of housing units. Uh, the other thing is that the two previous forecasts were looking at the vacancy rate you had pre-COVID. And it averaged 9.36% over many, many years. Uh, it fell off with housing construction uh, the year during the year after COVID. Uh, we see the vacancy rate going back up as housing construction goes back up. It's a relatively high vacancy rate, but it's, it's expected with a growing market where you're putting new housing on the market. And so you're gonna have housing units that are vacant for some period of time, but they, they get sold. And that's been the case every year going back to 1990 with those high vacancy rates. They all eventually get sold. So we see that uh, coming into play with the number of, uh, of households uh, increasing. So we do have that increase in the number of housing units. Next slide. How many units increase over the years? I brought all those numbers with me so I would have them. Yeah, so what we're looking at from 2024 through 2050 is 79,000 new housing units. Um, <clears throat> whereas the 2020 forecast would have had 85,000. But their forecast for this year is much higher than it actually is. So it, the, the end number is a little bit different than the difference in the annual growth rate. Do you have that broken down by geographic areas in Kern County? Yes, yeah, so the, the final part of the report, we look at population, household population, number of households, jobs, and housing units by regional sub area. How did you do that? Did you just look at land that was currently entitled? No. So I, I would say that that part of our report is not, don't, you tell me if I'm wrong, is not set in stone with this report. It's, you know, what we could piece together working with staff uh, based on some of the previous analysis that had been done for the 2022 RTP but we're also looking at about a 6.8% reduction in the number of housing units through 2050. So trying to whittle down the projection for each of those sub areas, uh, you know, accordingly, and some that performed a little bit better 
than the RTP had factored in. So there are a few changes in there. We kind of identify for each uh, regional sub area what the assumption was we used for that. But you, you weren't looking at zoning or, or uh, existing entitled land, anything like that. You were just looking at the size of a city, um, just people and assuming growth rates and Yes, but it was informed by the, okay. the analysis that staff had done for the 2022 RTP when they took a, a more in-depth look at that. So we weren't trying to rewrite the growth uh, allocation among the RSAs from what you already have. We are trying to maintain that, and there was just a couple little pieces we uh, tinkered with uh, because the actual looked a little bit different than what was in the uh, 2022 RTP. And then finally, we get to the number of jobs, and the economy is uh, performing well and looks like it'll continue to perform well. And so um, we're, the forecast has the number of jobs growing faster than the number of households and faster than the household population growth. So that would lead to an improvement in the jobs housing ratio. And lower unemployment. And lower unemployment. And there is, there is that symbiotic relationship because one of the reasons a business might relocate to Kern County is having a workforce uh, that they can't find elsewhere. Uh, other businesses, uh, you know, retail type businesses, they, they will, there's expanded retail opportunity as the population grows and consumer spending grows. So there is, there is that kind of mutual feeding of each other when we look at the employment numbers versus the household population growth numbers. Does any uh, of this relate to our arena stuff, or this was? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I mean, it seems like the arena numbers were a lot larger. Like, Bakersfield had 36,000 over, what, eight years or something? Housing units? It, it does relate. We, we, what we try to project is what KernCog does comes, in general. comes from this comes from, from this, it comes from zone, it also comes from zoning, comes from where we know the jobs are now, where we think the jobs are going to be in the future, but we're not always right. And it, some, some developers um, insist their, their areas are, are the only areas going to grow. We, that's not necessarily a reasonable assumption for our documents, but we have to balance all the different developments that are on the books, all the, other, all the entitlements that are on the books, and what we know about uh, what we think is going to happen with the population. The birth rate could change in 10 years. There could be new businesses that come. There could be natural disasters in Los Angeles. A AI could affect it also. And then we just, we do make one note in the report um, because there will be, uh, Kern Cog's practice has been to update this every four years in preparation for the RTP. So there would be an update to your forecast and an update to DOF's projections, which go to HCD and get massaged before HCD hands down a housing target for you in Kern County. Both of those will be updated before your next RENA cycle starts. So this is kind of where we stand today. This is where we see it going, but that may have a different look four years from now when these are updated and some of the trends are a little more clear what's going to happen.
So this just kind of shows those age groups. The blue line is zero to four year olds. So those are the, every five years, those are the babies that were born and maybe a few people moving to Kern County with an infant in tow. Uh, not really changing much through 2050. Uh, and then the five to 13 year olds dip and pick back up, but still lower in 2050. Uh, the 14 to 17 year olds, uh, I think is still lower in 2050. And then the 18 to 24 year olds being lower in 2050. So that's what's happening at the younger end of the age spectrum. And next slide. And then these are your older age groups. So we have the uh, 55 to 64 year olds um, <clears throat> and the 65 to 74 year olds kind of going up and then the 75 and older uh, really starting to um, add up as we go through the next 20 six years. And so that's that change in the age distribution, again, um, <clears throat> that we talked about previously. And the next slide. So that's kind of the summary of the big pieces that are in there. There are other smaller pieces, but it, the key thing is it's, it, it really all hinges on that fertility rate and what happens with migration and who is migrating to Kern County and how quickly they decide to migrate here. Everything else flows from that. Appreciate it. Interesting stuff. Any other questions? <laughs> Thank you. Yep. That was information only. Item six, Federal Transportation Improvement Program Draft Amendment Number 13. Good evening, Chair and members of the committee. Amendment number 13 includes changes to the transit program. The public review period ends on March 22nd. The Kern Cog Executive Director will consider approval of the amendment on March 25th. State and, state and federal approval is required. At this time, I ask the Chair to please open the public hearing, allow for public comment, and and then close the public hearing. Thank you. I will open the public hearing. Any public comment? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Caltrans report, Mr. Navarro's first up this time. I jumped the gun last book with the chair, so I was gonna wait to assure myself. <laughs> Yeah, I like that. Your tie matches your cup. Your cup. Well, look, I'm all you're orange today. You're good. Yeah. You're good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for noticing, Mr. Chair. Appreciate that. <laughs> good evening, all. Um, as we wrap up Clean California, kind of go out with a bang with a lot of activities over the next few months. Just kind of want to share some of those. So April 19th through 22nd, we're having Clean California Community Days that will coincide with Earth Day. And there's some events coming up in, in the Kern County area. So April 27th, we'll have a booth out at um, Keep Up Bakersfield Beautiful at the American Cleanup. We'll also plan to have some Caltrans volunteers come out here to participate in some cleanup activities. And then we're having some dump days on April 6th, um, Tire Amnesty Day in Shafter Wasco, uh, one in Taft. And then April 20th out, out at the landfill, we'll have another Tire Amnesty Day out there. I um, also want to share uh, February 21st, last month at Heritage Park, we had a, a really nice groundbreaking for the park out there for the Clean California money they were awarded. Um, well attended, so looking forward to the ribbon cutting next. And then for the Clean California projects we're working on, uh, so notice to proceed went to Kern Regional Transit for the bus shelters for the funding they were awarded. So they expect to get those ordered uh, in April. 
uh, Stay Route 204 project. So that one, as I mentioned before, is repackaged and re-advertised. The bids came in about a million over the engineer's estimate, but we're going to cover that with the Queen California Reserves. That project is going to start moving forward. Great. Uh, Garcia Circle, that contract was awarded on March 5th. So Kern Arts Council has begun working on the art component of the project. Uh, McFarland Delano project for the trail system was awarded. Uh, scheduled to begin construction as soon as we see the art proposal. So the contractor is working with Urban Collective to start the artwork requirements. And then at 99 in the California project, um, that project uh, agreement was executed end of January, awarded to PK Construction. And a uh, pre-construction meeting was held with Kern Arts. And they're working on the art component for this project as well. Uh, I do want to thank Kern Cog for their collaboration, uh, partnering on a grant application for the RAISE program um, in February for a request for uh, $25 million for State Route 9958 for that missing movement. And also want to share some upcoming uh, funding opportunities in the federal program. So it seems like it just ended, but coming around again is what they call the MPDG program, which is a multimodal project discretionary growth program. That's us, Mega Rural Infra. Um, they're expecting to notice a funding opportunity for those that come out in March or April. And then this is one of those programs where if your agency is applying and looking for a letter of support from Caltrans, um, we're gonna ask those to be submitted within 14 days of the NOFO so we can process those because process those, those have to go through headquarters. Um, in terms of projects, so Stay Route 46 and Stay Route 43 intersection improve, improvements. Uh, this one's being co coordinated with the Stay Route 46 so roadway project. That project's in the design phase, and they'll be combining construction in spring of 2025. Um, rehab project on 99 from Old US 99 to White Lane. Um, expected to complete construction of road work this month, so final striping is scheduled for the end of March, and then road work expected to be complete. Uh, Santa Fe roundabout and Shafter uh, project's still the design phase. We hope to have completion of design uh, this June. Project is probably not gonna happen until spring of 2026, however, because there's some permitting requirements with Federal Land Bureau of Reclamation that are, we're working on. Uh, Stay Route 46, segment 4C, project is still in construction. The contractor's currently out there working on the drainage system. They expect completion of that project uh, this summer. Uh, Maricopa Highway Cap M project, that's a rehab project. I mentioned that project was advertised. We expect it to be awarded any day to the, uh, the lowest bidder, which was Griffith Construction, and that construction activity will start this spring. Uh, also awarded Griffith Construction was a morning drive rehab project. This is from uh, Edison Highway heading north up to Chase Avenue. We expect that construction to start in May. That's a project where we're doing a rehab as long as some complete streets elements. And that completes my report. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I have a couple. Uh, Union Avenue 204, when's that supposed to start? So Union Avenue, that one was the one that was uh, just awarded. Um, came in slightly over the engineer's estimate, about a million dollars over. So it was, uh, let's see, bids are open on March 6th, and we're in the process of getting that awarded. Then we'll have a construction kickoff meeting. So hopefully by next month, after we have the construction kickoff meeting, I'll give you a little more details on working days and the actual first day of construction. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then I've asked you before about, you know, you did a great job on the westbound Rosedale Highway underneath 99. And I asked you and you said the eastbound was the cities. So I went back and asked the city, I don't know, that's Caltrans. So I would ask that, and I don't know, you know, somebody needs to look at the agreement, but it is Caltrans further west, I guess, to Mohawk. 299 mm -hmm. that's Caltrans so I would ask that you look at you know okay bike facilities in that area and also you have a monthly meeting with the city coordination meeting or something if, if you yeah, if you guys could get together and figure out really who's responsible and how, how yeah, we can no, get that. Yeah, no, definitely happy to look bound. back at that. I'll catch up with you after the meeting just to verify I have the right location. Um, okay. We do, we do monthly meetings internally where we look for different opportunities for light shop projects, complete streets. Yeah. But uh, as far as the, co the coordination meetings, um, the director sits in on those, and typically we do a quarterly meeting with our e executive leadership in the city, county, and current cog. Okay. But um, I'll, I'll put that as an action item, and I'll, I'll verify location with you maybe right. before we leave. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Yes. Council Member Smith. Good evening. I had asked on uh, previous meetings regarding uh, westbound 58 east of Tower Road to about Comanche. Uh, and thanks for, it looks like the work's been 
it's much improved through there. The big patch, uh, it was a real rough uh, right-hand lane. Mm -hmm. So looks like they've uh, got that done. And just to thank you for following up. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none, District 9. Very good, Neil Peacock. Uh, thank you for having me. It's my first time being here in person, so I really appreciate the opportunity to sit before you. Um, as far as Clean California goes, uh, we have a recycling event in Ridgecrest, Boron, and Rosamond um, scheduled for May 4th and June 8th. So we're excited to see that effort uh, and partnership continue. Um, we just did a tour of the Big Atlanta project, so I wanted to definitely say thank you and a nod to the historic partnership there. It's really impressive to see a project of that scale in construction, to see that much dirt turn and that, that much um, heavy equipment is, is really impressive. Um, it's a legacy for our, our uh, society. Um, so we have a bunch of other projects taking place. Um, our Freeman Gulch safety project and Rosamond rehab projects are all going to CTC um, now. Um, for early allocation for zero phase to advance those projects. Um, our Mojave uh, pavement rehab project is uh, between Silver Queen and Business 80, is, um, uh, which includes a bunch of um, guardrails and culverts as well as pavement and pedestrian access is um, in p and &E or I'm sorry, is in um, ps &E right now, scheduled for construction in 2027. So a lot of those projects are just continuing to move through the process. Um, our Cache Creek project, um, that's a pavement uh, rehab project, is wrapping up environmental now. Um, I just got done meeting with Jay Slosher, our city public, man, uh, public uh, works uh, manager there with the city of Tehachapi on our um, two pit projects that are going to be going um, to the public. Um, this is a pit phase project, so Golden Hills project and a, a, a preventative um, capital maintenance project taking place on SR 58. Um, those are going to be basically wrapping up PID phase, going to the public um, here in April. Um, we're excited to partner with um, Kern Cog through its OWP on um, freight and emergency preparedness planning um, um, efforts. So expect our comments on your OWP here um, shortly, which we coordinate with our partners over there in District 6. Um, we have a wide variety of um, small minor projects and um, ITS or intelligent transportation system projects. Uh, taking place throughout the, the district, um, such as a variety of um, safety uh, median devices um, on State Route 58 in Tehachapi. Um, we're working on a sewer replacement project over in Ridgecrest. Um, so you'll see new changeable message signs at several of our um, truck scale locations, um, as well as um, a variety of new census count station replacements taking place throughout the district. So we get better uh, travel data, um, possibly, you know, help inform some of the, the travel um, mod traffic demand modeling um, in, in addition to all the demographic research that you've just um, been presented on. Um, we have fiber optic going in on 202 um, over in Tehachapi and a variety of new projects coming online such as um, Rosamond Rehab number two. So we've done, that would be our second major um, rehab project over on um, SR 14 uh, in the Rosamond area. Um, as well as doing another cap -M project over in the, on Mojave Bypass. So a wide variety of work taking place in uh, Eastern Kern. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Peacock? Seeing none, Executive Director's Report. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and board members. Uh, CTC, California Transportation Commission, met today and they're going to continue meeting uh, tomorrow, the meeting did not end till about 6.30 today, 6.30 p.m. Uh, our, the, our STIP project at 58 and 99 was approved at about 6.30 p.m. Uh, it was a very contentious um, hearing over uh, mostly a project in Fre Fresno, Fresno County. We have action items on uh, the agenda for tomorrow. I want to say thank you to Mayor Ion from uh, McFarland, who is at the meeting, and he is prepared to testify tomorrow if it turns into uh, what happened today, which was very contentious. Also have um, several staff members there today. <coughs> so thank you. Um, and any of you who would like to attend a CTC meeting in the future, uh, it always helps to have elected officials uh, come and speak on behalf of projects. Uh, continue to have um, discussions about State Route 58 and 99, 204 and Union Avenue, 7 Standard and 43. Uh, sometime tomorrow, the um, 
new shoulders um, on Route 33, Supervisor Couch, are likely to get approved. Um, Caltrans Director is uh, going, to ask, going to be asking the CTC for some more money. That's uh, that long project on 33 where we repeatedly asked for uh, safety improvements and Caltrans agreed to do that. They need a little bit more money to make that happen. State Route 46 is making good prog progress. Also truck climbing lanes on 58, good progress. I talked to um, the head of Caltrans, Tony Tavares, with uh, Senator Grove uh, last week and thanked him again for both District 6 and District 9 working together to get that uh, project delivered on time. And staff also continues to attend uh, the stakeholder meetings on the long-term future of State Route 119, specifically in the area that's close to uh, 99, the um, area that's Bakersfield, Pumpkin Center, that area. Subject to any of your questions, Mr. Chairman, uh, that concludes my report. Any questions for the director? Seeing none, I will adjourn that meeting and move to the Kern Council of Governments meeting. Roll call, same. Public comments, same rules. Do we have any public comments for Kern Council of Governments meeting? Seeing none, consent agenda opportunity for public comment. Same rules, any public comments on the consent agenda? Does any member wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? Seeing none. Motion to approve. Second. Roll call, please. Phil Smith. Yes. Bob Smith. Yes. Raina. Yes. Prout. Yes. Perez. Yes. Uh, Morris. Yes. Cryer. Yes. Flores. Yes. Couch. Yes. And Blades. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Election of officers. Each year, the Kern Council of Governments Board of Directors selects a chairman and a vice chairman for the Kern Cog Board. Any comments or motions? <laughs> Council Member Smith. Without objection, I would move that we retain Bob Smith as chair and Zach Scribner as vice chair. I second, I second that motion. Thank you. <coughs> Any other nominations? Roll call vote, please. Blades. Aye. Uh, Couch. Yes. Flores. Yes. Cryer. Yes. Morse. Yes. Uh, Perez. Yes. Prout. Yes. Reyna. Yes. Bob Smith. Yes. Phil Smith. Yes. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Executive Director's Report. Good evening again, Mr. Chairman. Just a few items uh, on this, this agenda. Form 700s, if you haven't submitted them yet are due April 2nd. Please forward your copy to Ms. Napier. Last, last week I was in Sacramento for with the other seven counties from the central San Joaquin Valley. Met with um, our elected officials. I specifically met with uh, Senator Hurtado and um, Assemblyman Dr. Jasmine Baines. I also uh, separately, not part of the group, met with um, Assembly Member Fong's staff. Assembly Member Fong was not there. He was probably down here <laughs> campaigning. Uh, productive meeting. I also had a conversation with the head of Caltrans and uh, other executive directors. Uh, April 29th to May 1st uh, is the San Joaquin Valley Policy Conference in Visalia. I will be attending as well as several of our newer staff members. And if any of you are interested, please let me know in your folders this evening. Uh, may she rest in peace. A flyer for um, Mayor Trujillo's service, which is tomorrow. 
No, Saturday. Oh, visitation tomorrow, service Saturday, I'm sorry. The uh, community rides that were mentioned earlier for both March and April. A ribbon cutting for the DiGiorgio Road cycle track, March 26th. Timeline covering the next three months. A copy of uh, a letter that I sent to uh, the chairman of the CTC. That's what uh, Mayor Ione is going to be advocating for tomorrow. And also what our um, auditor from Brown Armstrong mentioned uh, at least two of our jurisdictions have had some problems with submitting their single audit report uh, on time. That applies to all cities that get more than $750,000 of, of uh, federal funds. It's due, as he said, March 31st of, of each year. Ours was submitted. Just a reminder uh, to your city managers that it's due in just a few days. And, and there are consequences if you don't submit that on time. Subject to any of your questions, Mr. Chairman, uh, that concludes my report. Thank you. I, I, congratulations again on the Adada report. We appreciate the work that you do. Any other comments for the director? Seeing none, I have a certificate of appreciation for Mr. Edgar Flickinger II. He's been working here since before I was born <laughs> for 35 years. Come on up, Ed. 35 years of dedicated service to Kern Council of Government, 1989 to 2024. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Appreciate your service. Right. <laughs> and with that, we are... Adjourned. Mm -hmm.